Welcome to our special broadcast as we focus on the chaos and disorder currently engulfing the country. South Africa is being hit by a wave of public violence, the likes of which we haven't seen since our transition to democracy. What started as an internal war in the ANC over the imprisonment of Jacob Zuma for contempt of court has now spilled over onto the streets. There are many contributing factors to the violence and criminality. A decade of economic stagnation, record levels of poverty, unemployment, corruption, state capture, and of course, a complete lack of leadership, a vacuum in fact, at the very top. But the most immediate cause of this is the fact that the state has lost the ability to enforce the law. Let's be clear, the criminality we are seeing in our streets isn't a spontaneous uprising. Many of these events were carefully orchestrated. A criminal ANC faction is using people to get their man off the hook, and they don't care about the consequences. How exactly did we get here? And will South Africa ever be free of the internal power struggles of the ANC? Today, we'll try answer these questions. But first, we have a look at the week in headlines. It's been a chaotic few days, scenes of violent protests where trucks have been set alight, roads blocked and shops looted played out. These are criminal elements. These are people who are sabotaging the economy of the country. These are people who are hell-bent on ensuring that there is instability in the country. More than 25 trucks have been set alight in the province so far. Moving essential goods, that's food, the pharmaceuticals that are critical right now in this COVID time. People are starting to worry about uh, food security, will they have food, will they have petrol, and there's a sense of unease. Hospitals and medical staff who are already stretched to their limits by COVID-19 now have to cope with injuries and disruptions caused by the unrest. Vaccine sites in Durban are shut down today because the vaccines could not reach them on time. It has a ripple effect as well, Dumelo. We're under a COVID-19 pandemic at the moment. People need medication. Police officers, they're at a point where they said they don't know what to do. Many residents are watching their homes burn, they're watching their businesses burn, they're scared for their family and they're scared for their future. This week in the headlines, as large parts of the country go up in flames, South Africans have to protect themselves. Our vaccine rollout is stopped due to riots just as the lockdown is extended. An anarchy in KZN and Gauteng destroys supply chains, businesses and jobs. After days of unrest, President Ramaphosa finally agreed to deploy 2,500 soldiers to parts of KZN and Gauteng. This number pales in comparison to the 76,000 soldiers deployed to stop surfers and beachgoers during the first lockdown. Meanwhile, SAPS is nowhere to be seen and citizens must protect themselves. Imagine Becky Tsele's gun bill coming into law now. Ordinary people would be left defenseless in this kind of situation. Just as our vaccine rollout was picking up pace, it's come to an abrupt halt. The looting and golfing parts of the country have caused many vaccination sites to close. After Ramaphosa's Sunday lockdown extension, the halting of vaccinations will have the consequence of extending lockdowns even further. This will destroy even more lives and livelihoods. Law and order must be restored not just for the sake of the economy or to protect property, but also to ensure that we overcome this COVID-19 pandemic. Testimony before the Zonder Commission has already revealed that the State Security Agency is entangled in the internal politics of the ANC, and we are now living the consequences. How is it possible that despite ample warning that this was going to happen on social media and public pronouncements, that SAPS and the State Security Agency was caught unprepared to prevent the destruction of property and the loss of lives. There are now reports of members of the intelligence community aligned to Zuma instigating the unrest. It appears that our intelligence services have a great deal to answer for and the DA will make sure that they are held to account. The economic impact of the chaos in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng is likely to have massive effects across the entire country. Looters have targeted shops and shopping centers, looting factories, leaving a trail of destruction. And we now hear of farms being attacked and farmers having to pour thousands of liters of milk down the drain. 
the livelihoods of thousands of South Africans have been completely wiped out in the course of only a few days. And as food, medicine and other essential supplies run out in many of these affected areas, what can we expect to happen next? It is yet again honest, hard-working South Africans who are paying the price for decades of failed leadership and factionalism in the ANC. We also want to extend our sincere condolences to the families of the 72 South Africans who have lost their lives in the violence. It is indeed a sad day for our country. Moving on to the spotlight feature this week, how do we restore law and order and win the war on corruption in South Africa? We'll take a look at this story in the spotlight. Jacob Zuma has started his 15-month sentence. His incarceration has angered Zuma's supporters and exposed rifts within the African National Congress. Protests that brought Kazuna Natal to a halt yesterday are continuing. On Monday, the violence continued for the fourth day, forcing the government to call in the army. Trucks were set alight, shots fired and vehicles stoned. Supporters of the former president are demanding his release. Jacob Zuma's arrests have spilled into Gauteng in Alexandria. Sandra. With fears of violence spreading to other provinces, what does this mean for the stability of our country? And are these protests still about former president's incarceration or something else? It's not sporadic violence, it's organized violence that's taking place. This is not a popular uprising in any sense of the word. And certainly this is instigated. This is not spontaneous anger. If President Zuma is going to be imprisoned, there will be instability and unrest in South Africa. Yeah. If ever there's bloodshed, so be it. If you are in a situation of war, so be it. Zuma's daughter, through her Twitter account, has seemingly lauded the situation in various parts of the province. Some on Twitter have called for accounts to be reported for inciting violence. At least 45 people have been killed in the escalating violence. If this continues, it's going to create a bloodbath. The bottom line is this is pure criminality. Today, South Africans witness open looting in full view of our cameras. Many will be wondering what we will wake up to tomorrow. Last week, the Constitution prevailed in one of the most important tests yet. Jacob Zuma, a former president with a large popular constituency inside the governing party, was jailed for contempt of the Constitutional Court. The DA has defended the rule of law and the Constitution against Mr. Zuma's attacks since before he was elected president, when he should have faced trial on charges relating to the arms deal of the 1990s. When the National Prosecuting Authority caved to political pressure and decided not to follow evidence of fraud and corruption against Zuma, it was the DA that went to court to compel the MPA to do its job. We were convinced that this was an essential battle to securing our constitutional democracy and the hope of millions of South Africans for jobs, opportunities, decent schools, hospitals and safe streets, the aspirations of our constitution. Had we listened to some political commentators who feigned outrage at our Stop Zuma campaign in the 2009 general election, the case against Zuma would have gone nowhere. That's something to think about when commentators tear into the DA for being tone deaf or otherwise refuse, refusing to be a sugar-coated version of the ANC. But even if, and this is still a big if, Zuma can be brought to justice, what about the web of corruption that the ANC has spun in every nook and cranny of this country? What about the crooks who are aligned to the Ramaphosa faction of the ANC and the promises made to them to buy their loyalty? It is estimated that over a half a million rand is lost every minute, every minute, to corruption in South Africa. Most recently, billions were stolen by corrupt politicians in the PPE and COVID-related tender scandals at the height of the pandemic. Exploiting disease and death for self-enrichment, these comrades are worse than grave robbers. As an immediate step, those fanning the flames of the countrywide unrest must urgently face arrest and be charged, including Zuma's children. In the president's address on Monday night, it was clear that the president and his government had no real plan and that citizens would have to face mobs of rioters and looters entirely on their own. 
To discuss all of this and more, we're joined in studio by the DA Federal Council Chair Helen Ziller, DA Shadow Minister in the Presidency Sali Malatsi, and on Zoom, political analyst Moiletsi Mbeki. Welcome to our guests. Helen, I'm going to start with you. Uh, a week or two ago, Valdemar Pelser, editor of Rapport, wrote a fascinating piece in which he pointed out that our Stop Zuma campaign of 2009 has been vindicated, despite all of the criticism, if we weren't convinced of the threat posed by Zuma to our constitutional democracy, we wouldn't have acted. What did you see back then that most commentators and most South African voters, quite frankly, didn't? Well, it was the DA who saw it. I happened to be the leader and I was very honored to be in that position. But it was clear to all of us from day one when Mokotedi Mpeshe, who was the acting national director of public prosecutions, withdrew the case or the cases against Zuma, and there were many, and said it was because of what he'd heard on a taped conversation, which must have been illegally taped, between Leonard McCarthy, the head of the Scorpions at the time, and Bulalani Nguka, who was our national director of public prosecutions, he said that what he'd heard in that taped conversation convinced him that there was politics behind the charges against Jacob Zuma, and therefore he decided to withdraw the charges. Now, that seemed absurd to us because the charges had been backed by a lot of evidence at that stage, encrypted faxes and all sorts of other things. And we said, well, if that tape was so incriminating, let us hear what is on it. And of course, he refused to let us hear what is on it. And we then pursued it through the courts, through seven court hearings, right to the very top, and then also through having to get a mandamus for various institutions of state to implement the court judgment until at last we got those tapes. And to be sure, when we listened to those tapes, there was nothing at all that could have justified the withdrawal of the charges. And that enabled them to be reinstated. So that is absolutely critical. But I think when one thinks back to that time in 2009, the Zoomophoria was as big, if not bigger, than the Ramaphoria of 2019. Hmm. It was an absolute national rejoicing. So Lenzima Vavi called it uh, the tsunami. Yeah, the tsunami, exactly. Yeah. And it was exactly how it was seen at the time. There was a, a national rejoicing. Even establishment commentators like Peter Bruce really welcomed the election of Zuma. And we in the DA, I think alone, said this is a very dangerous move. He's a corrupt man. He's going to corrupt our institutions. We'd been talking about state capture for about 10 years by then. And we said he will capture all institutions of state to protect himself and his faction, which duly happened. But we alone saw that at that stage. Hence, our, we did all the analysis in the background, but when it landed on a poster, it just said, stop Zuma. Two words that captured all of that analysis behind it. And it was incredibly unpopular at the time. Oh, tone deaf, we aren't hearing what the people are saying. We don't know, we aren't, are we out of touch? We said, this is our prognosis for the future of South Africa under Zuma. Our job as a political party is to spot the trends, to give them voice, and to warn South Africans. That's our job. And we are saying, stop Zuma. And after that, even in our caucus, when I said we've got to pursue Zuma on these charges, there was a huge amount of discomfort at saying, look, we've pushed hard enough. We've alienated enough people in South Africa. And now we're going to come and come with a court case to get those tapes, to get Zuma charged. It's totally against the public spirit of the time. And my view has always been, and I've repeatedly said it, our job is to get 10 years into the future and look back from that point and say what will have been right in 10 years time. And it's certainly not what would have been expedient today. Hmm. And we'll get to the future in a moment. Sali Malazzi, I want to bring you in here. Yeah. Fast forward from Zuma's prosecution and his contempt of court and being jailed. We know now that public opinion can be manipulated and in a very cynical way, Bell Pottinger certainly taught us that yeah. lesson. Is what we're experiencing now, at least in part, the attempt 
of a cynical faction within the ANC to blackmail the country, to blackmail the courts and to subvert the course of justice so that their man can uh, escape uh, justice. Absolutely. If you look at all the evidence that's at play, even from the sentiments of Jacob Zuma himself on the day, and you try and dissect the message that was um, being said about all the excuses that he was putting in place um, in order to subvert the course of justice, it was to blackmail the country. And it was to shift attention away from the historic long cases of corruption and, you know, going as far back as to his time as the deputy president of the country and even um, during his presidency, that it was a very clear attempt to capture the state, as Helen has said, but to use that in such a way that he protects himself from possible future prosecution. And you know, once he has lost control of the state and losing the presidency then, it then manifested itself in the um, legal tactics that he adopted, you know, in order to try and circumvent that. And what we have seen through statements such as those made by people like Carl Nihas, you know, his, 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 his family, in order to manipulate the inequality in the country and try and use that to rally uh, people into standing up for someone who has throughout his political career in charge of the country expressed disregard for the law. And these protests that are happening now, they are a spillover of the long factional battles in the ANC. And most importantly, the ANC's abuse of the state machinery to protect its leaders when it's time to account so that there is impunity. If throughout the lifespan of the deputy presidency of Jacob Zuma and even the presidency, the ANC had done the right things in parliament legally, we would not be in the situation that we're in. And that also affects how the state responds. If you look at the state's response itself into the gatherings at Inkantla, it basically allowed people to break the law by gathering in there. Had that been done by ordinary civilians, we know that this government always has an appetite to be excessive in responding, in responding to instances of law breaking by civilians. But when it comes to key um, people aligned to the government and most importantly to the ANC, the state's response is inadequate. And in fact, it's non-existent because no state that has proper intelligence services would not have anticipated that there would be this breakout of disruption and instability in KZN in particular and in some part of the country. So to listen to the um, Minister of Intelligence saying that they'd been able to subvert more serious damage, it's basically laughable because if the state um, intelligence sector had done its job fully, it would have anticipated that there would be this level of response and put in measures to contain that. And, you know, sometimes we don't look at these things uh, in great detail, but it also displays how the inadequate funding, for instance, of the South African Police Service has damaging effects because now the police cannot respond adequately. They're being overpowered by criminal elements in only two provinces. Can you imagine if this outbreak was throughout the country where the rest of the country would be? And all of this are done simply because the ANC's program of governance has not been to the betterment of the country. You look at the allocation of budgets to the police, right? And you look at the allocation of budgets to the VIP protection unit. It talks about skewed priorities. And when those are needed the most during a times like that, a lot of people, we don't think about that. But what we are seeing is the consequence also of years and years of underinvestment in the South African police service in order to prepare them to respond well for situations like this. And I want to get to the police in a moment, but first you, you mentioned something Jacob Zuma presided over a government whose policies failed. Yep. Failed to address poverty, unemployment, inequality. And yet now he wants to capitalize on that failure. He wants to use the folks who suffered most at the hands of his government's actions. He wants to use them as cannon fodder in order to escape justice. Is, is this what we see? It's a very classic case of exempting himself from the rot that society is currently in. Because what it then does is to appeal 
uh, by manipulating the emotive state of inequality in the country and manipulating the state of you know, people who encounter poverty on a daily basis to say somehow I've been your champion and because I've been your champion, I'm being victimized. Mm. Which is totally the outrageous. Into a chess board of internal ANC. Exactly, games. which is totally outrageous. And the long term consequences of this is that people who are currently poor will be trapped in poverty for a long time. People who are losing livelihoods now, it will become almost impossible to rebuild those. And the most people who are affected by this will be young people who will never stand the chance of being employable because of the disruption that has happened in the economy now, who never have the opportunity to rebuild their livelihoods ever again. And those things have a long-standing impact into the future of the country and how we prepare people to better participate in the economy, because there will be no economy left. Mm. Sally, then, the strange thing that we've seen is the absolute enthusiasm of especially the police minister to enforce the lockdown regulations, to go after people for petty offences during the lockdown. Yeah. Charismatic, expressive, bombastic, not charismatic, bombastic probably. And a completely changed man when it comes to responding to the most basic task of the police to protect people uh, from, from public violence. Why is the government so lethargic in their response, especially in KwaZulu-Natal, to fulfilling basic police functions. It's one of the most curious things to observe in, in all of this. And you almost get the sense that is government scared to respond appropriately to blatant instances of criminal behavior? I mean, we all remember how the minister was even taking tours of beaches in order to enforce, you know, um, the law during, um, you know, purported violations of lockdown regulations. But he hasn't been anywhere with cameras looking at the destruction of public property, providing even moral support to the law enforcement officers who are in the line of fire. He hasn't been there, you know. Um, we've had our leader being on the ground, showing compassion, showing leadership to be on the ground, to provide moral support to people who have suffered great laws, but most importantly, to be seen, to be caring. Our law enforcement officers, when the time gets tough, they are left to be on their own, you know, by politicians. Begitel is always eager to be um, showcasing the strength of the law when it comes to dealing with civilians and peaceful civilians, but when it's time to face blatant acts of criminal behavior, he's not anywhere to be found. And this goes back to the initial um, um, remarks that I made earlier. It was always clear from the build up in those six days where it was anticipated that pres the president should hand himself over, that the gatherings that were happening in Uganda were going to lead into something bigger. Even then, there was no deployment of law enforcement officers to stop that from happening. Because despite ample warning. Exactly, despite ample warning. And it was playing out in broad daylight for everyone to see, where they scared to take to be seen to be taking action against President Zuma and those associated with him. Because if we are all equal before the law, every infringement of the law must get the same reaction regardless of whether you know, we are politicians or it is ordinary South Africans that are breaching the law. And this has been one of the standout points in there. It's been that the police, and through instruction by you know, the political leadership in charge, have been you know, hamstrung from acting out of fear of being seen to be acting against someone who is the former president of the country. And it is absolutely wrong. Well, as Sonia has mentioned, uh, DA leader John Stiernazen is in his home province of KwaZulu-Natal monitoring the situation and speaking to affected communities. Let's have a look at this. I'm here uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. I flew in uh, yesterday to be on the ground. I think it's important that leaders are on the ground to see for themselves uh, what is happening out there in South Africa, and particularly in places like KwaZulu-Natal. And I challenge the president and the other leaders uh, to come here and see for themselves the devastation. You can only appreciate it on the ground. You can see behind me 
community manning a, a roadblock to be able to protect uh, a food source uh, here in their community. Uh, today I'll be continuing my visits to affected communities, people who have been victims of looting, shop owners, uh, community members who have been injured, lost loved ones, uh, some of the police services I'll be visiting today to uh, chat to them, uh, and you know, just assessing the situation and putting on pressure on the president to deploy more SANDF personnel here. The police have lost the initiative, they need personnel, they need boots on the ground, and that needs to happen quickly. There needs to be a far more coordinated response. I'm calling for a coordination centre to be set up here in Durban, uh, where you're able to coordinate the efforts of the Metro Police, the South African Police Service, bring on board private security, as well as neighbourhood watch groups to try and restore law and order here in KwaZulu-Natal. And then I'm appealing for calm. Citizens here in KwaZulu-Natal should not take the law into their own hands. We must respect the rule of law in South Africa. This is not a time for vigilantism. Uh, there is a right for communities to step in and protect themselves, but it mustn't spill over into vigilantism. Uh, and then for cool heads to prevail. We need uh, calm, we need to make rational decisions, and we also need to address some of the underlying issues that have led to the mass looting that we've seen. Yes, the political uh, instigation was a spark to it, but there's also a deeply unequal society that lies underneath this. 30 million people living in poverty have been let down by two decades of failed government policies a 75% youth unemployment rate, a national unemployment rate of 42%, and an economy that's not growing and after this is going to struggle even further. These are the underlying tensions that just needed a small spot to be able to set off what we've seen over the last few weeks. Uh, and we need to start to address those issues in the country and to fight poverty head on and to just focus not on you know, what government's doing at the moment, stealing money and looking for opportunity for friends and family, but actually starting to lift those 30 million people out of poverty into opportunity. So the scenes that we witnessed in KwaZulu-Natal, we never see again uh, in South Africa. And we want to get to those economic conditions that uh, John mentioned towards the end. But Solly, first, it's almost as if the country has completely forgotten about the COVID-19 pandemic and in the, of the cycle of lockdowns that we are in because we can't get the vaccine out, we can't get the jab out. What has the effect been on our vaccination effort and how do we address the situation? Sure. I mean, one of the disheartening things um, currently is that obviously vaccine rollout where they were happening have had to stop in KZN and in Gauteng because of these levels of violence. But even prior to that, our vaccination rollout was underwhelming, you know, because the government had not adequately prepared in making sure that it secure vaccines well in time to make sure that the population would be sufficiently um, vaccinated. I mean, I was reading um, from some reports today that only a fraction of 1.5 million South Africans have been fully vaccinated, those who had to get the, the double shots. That is a tiny, tiny number compared to the time that the government had in order to do the projections that it all needed and making sure because we're always aware that once the vaccines are available, government should have put the plans in place to make sure that the procurement um, and the funding that is needed for that is done in advance so that once all the legalities were sorted in terms of the distribution of the vaccines, make sure that we have enough of those um, in order to have a bigger impact, particularly taking into consideration the state of our public health system and the reality that we needed to be vaccinating far many people than we were given the rising number of the cases. And given what is already happening now in KZN and Gauteng, some of those doses will never you know, um, they will never be available again because they are being destroyed and not being transported to the destinations that need to, 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 to get you. And as a result, the trickle effect is that we are going to end up risking more infections in communities that should have been vaccinated. And all of this comes down to poor government foresight and planning and making sure that resources are allocated and projected in time to reach those destinations that are needed. Mm. Helen, I want to get back to you and, and the prosecution of Jacob Zuma. Do you think that if Zuma is brought to justice and if his faction of the ANC is neutralised 
and the Zuma problem is solved, will it solve the problem that is playing out on our television screens at the moment? Well, a problem in a country is never really solved because life is just a series of problems that have to be solved. And I suppose the life of nations is also just a series of problems to be solved. And some countries can solve them better than others. And of course, this won't solve the problem because we've learnt from democracies that have reached what they call end of history status. Of course, there's no such thing as the end of history, but points at where people can assume that they live peacefully, comfortably, with reasonable levels of prosperity, without gaping inequality. Those are countries that have achieved a couple of things. The rule of law and constitutionalism is one. The second one is a capable state. Now, however much this internal fighting in the ANC may or may not be resolved, it won't resolve the crisis of the incapable state that we sit here with. A culture of accountability, and we're still a long way from achieving a general culture of accountability in which voters vote corrupt governments out, and also policies, as John was saying, policies that can attract investment, growth, and create jobs. That is what South Africa needs to really get to the heart of the underlying problem. And although if the events happen as you say they will, Jacob Zuma is brought to justice and this uprising is quelled, it will be certainly a big step and an important step in the right direction. All the underlying factors, a capable state, the real entrenchment of a culture of accountability everywhere in our society and policies that attract investment and grow jobs. Business is not a swear word. We need much more of it in South Africa to create jobs and to enable people to get out of poverty. Those are the things without which a democracy can't succeed. Mm. So the, the Zuma problem is a manifestation of a much bigger problem. So as important as that, uh, as that battle is to our democracy and to achieving the, the standard of life that you speak of, uh, it, it's not the only. It's well, it, not the only thing that needs to be done. It certainly isn't the only, but it's symptomatic of what holds so many African countries back. And the core problem is patronage. Constitutional democracies believe that state institutions are there to serve everybody and to protect everybody's interests against the kind of thing that we're seeing in KwaZulu-Natal at the moment. Jacob Zuma and his faction believe, having been elected, they can control the institutions of state to protect themselves against the people. And this whole notion of using those institutions and their tenders and their contracting systems and supply chain management to look after your friends, your families, your network, your group, is the thing that undermines all of the critical things I've been talking about, the capable state, the rule of law, the culture of accountability, and policies that can grow the economy. That is the root problem of which the Zuma uprising, as we see it, is just a manifestation. Mm. Well, let's in Becky, I want to turn to you now. We have all been critical, or some of us have been critical of the president's response uh, to the current situation. But one thing I think we can agree with is that the looting and criminality that we've seen is not the character of the South African people, certainly not the majority of people. And if that is true, what accounts for what we are seeing? Well, I am very nervous about big generalizations like what is the character of, of, of South African people. Uh, I, I'm really, I'm very nervous about, we, we have to, in my view, we have to talk about what we aspire to achieve, not about what a static uh, position that we think we are in. I think most South Africans want as the two previous speakers have said, they, they want the, the, the country to advance. Uh, most adult South Africans want to work, want to contribute to, to, to the country. But that's what human beings all over the world want to see 
happen. They want to make a contribution and they want to benefit from the contribution that they make. Most of us don't mind paying taxes, but we want to benefit from those taxes in the form of development of the country, in the form of security, of peace and security in the country. So I, I, I think uh, I'm very nervous about saying this is what South Africans are, this is what they are not, because to me, that's the beginning of, 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 uh, of setting up stereotypes uh, and, and then finding people who you define as stepping out of stereotypes. Uh, and I really, I think that's a, a very dangerous route to, to travel. We, we know the, the worst manifestation of those kinds of stereotypes were in Germany in the 30s and in the 40s and in the 20s, where they said, this is who the German people are. And then they went out and, and demonized the Jewish people and they demonized the social democrats and they demonized, and they said, we must get rid of, of, of these people and we know what the consequences of that were. So in my view, I think we have to avoid uh, creating stereotypes, which we then uh, force uh, people uh, to live by the, or exclude those we say don't fit into, into that stereotype. So if, if the key is, the aspirations that people have and conditions for fulfilling those aspirations or, or reaching those aspirations. What have been the failures of government policy so that a, a demagogue such as Jacob Zuma has got such a fertile uh, ground in order to, to stoke unrest? What, what is at the root of that failure and, and what can we do about it? Well, the, the, the failure of the ANC during the last 27 years has been its refusal to develop entrepreneurship in South Africa and instead to promote redistribution of existing wealth towards the black elite, towards the black upper class that runs the ANC. That has been the fundamental failure. And what has this led to? It has led to the transfer of resources from people who are producing through the tax system. They are taxed and those re resources are redistributed for consumption, not for job creation, not for enterprise creation, but for the consumption of, of, of the black middle class and of the, of the, of the black elite. They, that has been the fundamental failure of the ANC. I have said it to Mandela, I have said it to Thabo Mbeki, I have said it to Jacob Zuma and, and to the Cyril Ramaphosa. That is the fundamental failure of the ANC and that's why our economy is at a standstill. Instead of us using our savings, whatever savings we have, to get people who want to be entrepreneurs, and there are many South Africans who want to be entrepreneurs, to create jobs, to create new businesses. And of course, as has been pointed out by Helen, to attract other investors from other parts of the world. We have policies like Black Economic Empowerment that are obstructing the development of, of, of the country. And that, to me, those are the issues that we, uh, we have to address. And going with them is the failed education system. Uh, and going with that is our infrastructure, which is starting to, to, to really become undermined. And then the loss of morale that we have in the population, which then leads to, uh, to, to the rioting that we, see, we have seen happening uh, in the last few days. So if we have this elite and this system that's been created so that leaders act as proxies 
uh, on behalf of the poor and working people that's, that's been to their disadvantage. Do you see a turning point where people will start turning against the ANC and, and start attributing the failure uh, to the ANC? Uh, do, do you see that? Do you have hope for it? Is this the turning point or, or is it at some other stage? Well, we, we saw the very clear sign of the turning point in the last local government election, where the ANC lost majorities in all the major uh, metros, in all the metros in Gauteng, for example. So it is the people who were ANC voters, either stayed at home or voted for uh, opposition parties. So the tide is definitely turning, uh, uh, and the anger that you're seeing with this rioting and with this looting is an expression of, of the desperation in a way that the, these poor people have no voice. They feel they have no voice. They don't know where to turn to. So, so, so the tide has turned against the ANC. It lost the Swane Metro. It lost majority. It lost Johannesburg. It lost the Kuruleni. It lost Nelson Mandela Bay. It has lost Cape Town for, uh, for, for, for a while. So you can see where the most developed parts of our society are. They are no longer voting ANC. They are moving away from the ANC. But of course, we still have uh, rural areas. We still have areas with the ANC is trying to make them dependent on the state through social grants and, and such like, and the chiefs are helping it. So those are the, the, the counterbalance that the ANC uses. But for, for, for in terms of the, the populations in the big metros, uh, I think it's very clear that the ANC has lost the, the, that particular dominance which it had uh, in the in the big metros in South Africa. So Helen, the ANC, according to Moiletsi, is deteriorating, but is it happening fast enough to save what needs to be saved in this country in order to, to reach a, a high road? Yes, uh, I think the ANC's high point was in 2004. I said so then under President Mbeki. And I said then it will be all downhill from here. And I think you've seen that very slow unraveling with a, with a high peak for Jacob Zuma in 2009, but not nearly as high as 2004. And the critical thing is that the DA has said, we can't wait for the ANC to unravel. We have to win where we can. And we started at local government level with Cape Town and 30 other municipalities. We started with shaky coalitions because it was very difficult to bring the ANC below 50%. And of course, to govern, you have to have 50% plus one. So we could only get there with these very rickety coalitions. And in some places like Cape Town and other places, they worked. And the whole of the Western Cape is now DA. And if you juxtapose the capable state of the Western Cape and Cape Town, and juxtapose where the DA governs and where the ANC governs, you can clearly see the choice before South Africans. Now, that doesn't mean to say that life is not grim for a lot of newly arrived citizens in the city of Cape Town, for example. It is very, very difficult to provide services to large numbers of people coming in and wanting to find a piece of ground to live in and often invading land for that purpose. But Cape Town is the only place that is keeping up with that demand, at least with the very basics, that doesn't steal people's money out of the major metros. We, we certainly tried to set up governments as minority coalitions in Johannesburg and Chwani, and that turned out to be unbelievably difficult. To, to depend on your arch enemy, the EFF, to keep you in power through their vote is something we tried, but I think it was something that failed. And so the lesson has to be very clear to all voters in this election. If you want stable government, if you want good government, if you want government 
that really drives policies that attract investment and growth and bring down unemployment so as to deal with the underlying issues that Mr. Mbeki was talking about, the only governments that do that are DA governments. That's why unemployment, despite the massive urbanization to the Western Cape, is much lower in this province than it is elsewhere in South Africa. So that is the critical lesson people must learn. If they want stable, progressive government that deals with the underlying issues that gave rise to what we've seen in this last week, then really they must start by getting a functional, capable party to build a capable state that applies the rule of law and follows policies that can attract investment and growth and entrepreneurs, as Moiletsi says. That is the lesson, and all we can do is keep on repeating it again and again and again until people get it. Mm. So, Ellen, that crystal, crystal ball of yours that you gazed into 12 years ago and that predicted a lot of what is happening now, if you look into it again 10 years into the future, which you said is so very important for an opposition party to do, what do you see and what can we do to, to win this, this war against corruption uh, and to restore law and order in the country? Well, what I see is this being a major, major disruption that is part of the ANC coming apart. The ANC started coming apart in the 1990s when um, Bantu Holomisa left the ANC and various other things. And it's been a slow chipping away ever since. There are big catalytic moments such as the formation of COPE and the EFF, but this is another very big one. And I've always said, and I've said it for many years, the real question in South African politics is, do you want the DA's policies, the rule of law, non-racialism, <clears throat> a capable state, policies that grow the economy and create jobs, separation between the party and the state, DA policies, versus EFF policies, party control of the state, state control of the society, racial nationalism, anti-white racism, there it is. That is the choice for all South Africans. The ANC is divided between those choices. The RET faction is with the EFF, and the constitutionalists would at least mouth the rhetoric that the DA puts into practice. So what we are seeing now is the coming apart of the ANC at the seams. And if Jacob Zuma stays in jail, and if the constitution works, and if he's charged with corruption, it will be a big victory for constitutionalism. It'll help the ANC come apart, which is what must happen, and it will help South Africa avoid, avoid the failed state status that has been the bane of so many other countries on our continent, where the Jacob Zumas won the battle, not the constitutionalists. And so the DA is the home of constitutionalism, and as the ANC comes apart, we have to have a realignment of politics so that you can see the EFF's policies versus the DA's policies as the real choice facing South Africa. I want uh, the outsider in the discussion, the non-politician, to have the final word. Uh, uh, Moletsi, do you have hope uh, for the future, despite everything that we're seeing now? Well, well, for me, what, what we're seeing, uh, <clears throat> as Helen says, it is the unraveling of the ANC. Uh, the, the people of South Africa have given the ANC 27 years uh, to, to, to help solve the problems that they are faced with uh, and that the country is faced with <clears throat> because they thought the ANC could do it. What we have seen is more and more bad faith on the part of the ANC leadership towards the voters, towards the people of South Africa. Uh, more and more selfish policies, like I said, uh, where they enrich themselves through policies like black economic empowerment. So my view is we in South Africa, we have those of us who want South Africa to develop. Not everybody wants South Africa to develop. There are some who want to live off 
uh, the so-called fat of the land, and they don't want to make the effort. Developing a country requires effort. It, it requires a lot of hard work. Uh, the, we have billionaires in this country who have, billionaire, who have become billionaires by living off the fat of the land, who have contributed nothing but are selling their office, they are selling political office. So those are, 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 are the situations that we, we are faced with. But we have to press ahead and bring together those who want South Africa to develop, those who want South Africa to, to reach the potential, which we all know South Africa is capable of. But you can't reach the potential by sitting there and being given money from existing companies or, 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 or stealing money from the taxpayer. So there you have it, in the midst of the chaos and the confusion that you see on your TV screens, the important point to remember is that we live in a democracy where we choose our leaders, uh, and often the answer to many of our problems is political. We'll be back right after this. Well, the official opposition wants Parliament to intervene in the crisis around the former president. DA leader John Steenhuizen says there cannot be different rules for citizens and for Zuma supporters attending what he called a super spreader event. The purpose of the debate would be to do what Parliament needs to do to hold the executive, the president and his ministers accountable for the events over the course of the last uh, few days. Um, I think it's very important that we get clarity on how the police minister and the commission of police use the state attorney to write a letter to the apex court essentially second guessing their judgment. Um, why on earth we have a situation where lockdown regulations are applied against citizens across the country uh, and yet the uh, Zuma supporters out in Kandla are immune to those regulations. Why people like um, like um, Collins Causa and many others had to die or be victimized or abused uh, at the hands of the police uh, when that South same police just completely turns a blind eye to uh, super spreader events taking place across South Africa. I think these are all things that need to be answered because they all affect the rule of law in South Africa and it, it, the principle of equality before the law. There cannot be two sets of rules in South Africa, one for the ANC and the Connected and one for the rest of the citizens, particularly when so many South Africans have been asked to make such incredible sacrifices, close their businesses, shut down their only set sources of income, and yet they watch the scenes unfolding over the weekend uh, where, the, where it was treated with impunity. And I think that uh, these, are the, these are the questions that the President and his ministers should be forced to answer in the National Assembly. We're now joined by the DA Chief Whip in Parliament, Natasha Mazzone, who is going to speak to us about the mo more immediate question of restoring law and order. Natasha, welcome. Thank you, Sidi. It's good to be here. Thank you. What are the decisive steps that the DA is calling for at the moment? It's quite simple, actually. We are calling for a mass deployment of the SANDF to assist police forces uh, in KwaZulu-Natal and in uh, Gauteng areas where the violence is fled out of control. We are asking for um, police services that are available, extra police services, to be sent into those areas. In other words, everyone that's on leave, everyone that's uh, uh, scattered around the country must please come and, and back up these forces. We're also asking, we have 8,000 VIP security forces across our country. We're asking for ministers and premiers and the likes to relinquish their security services. 8,000. 8,000. And bring in those VIP securities into the areas uh, that we require them. We're asking for Parliament to immediately reconvene. There are portfolio committees such as health, such as minerals, such as safety and security, such as national intelligence that have to reconvene. But on top of that, Parliament itself has to reconvene because the people of the country are in a 
dire state. People are terrified all around the country. Doesn't matter what province you live in, you are simply now waiting for the violence to hit your province. And what you need to see is you need to see that your leaders are not hiding out in their bunkers in Santon or in their fancy homes surrounded by 200 uh, plus VIP security. You want to see your MPs in the National Assembly having these discussions and coming up with solutions in the public terrain. We don't want them done behind closed doors. We want these debates to be out in the open and South Africans must hear what MPs are saying. So in other words, South Africans must hear the DA saying, deploy the SANDF and make sure that they are there to back up the police force. South Africans must hear the EFF saying, we will go to war if the, EF, if the SANDF take to the streets to back up the police force. We must hear the silent members of the ANC who are keeping silent because there is a sinister force at work behind the outbreak of violence. Because a protest stops being a protest the minute a rock is thrown. The minute there is violence, you become a thug. You so, stop so being a protester. Th that, is, that is the response to the criticism of what use is there to reconvene parliament and have speeches. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think I think we must remember that, you know, it's very easy for someone to be a keyboard warrior, you know, who sits behind a computer on a, on a Saturday evening meeting a deadline and thinking, well, this bunch of palookas in parliament, what are they doing? What they don't know is that uh, someone like John Steenhuis and myself, you, Solly, we haven't slept for the last 48 hours because we are trying to uh, get help into these areas. We're trying to maintain calm. We're getting our public reps to assist. We're stopping vigilantism. Uh, we're trying to get neighborhood watches up and going, but without creating a situation where it becomes just out of control shooting. We're trying to get oxygen to hospitals because, as we know, Afrox um, had to shut down operations and then had a, a massive fire there. We're looking at a fuel shortage problem, so we're trying to get public reps to calm people down at uh, petrol stations so that we don't have panic buying. I mean, I saw on TV yesterday a spa in KZN where people were being threatened to be arrested because they were not adhering to a one and a half metre distance between each other. But right next door at a macro, a gentleman, well, I say gentleman very loosely, carried a double door Samsung fridge freezer out of the macro on his head in front of a policeman watching him. But they were going to arrest the people standing outside spa trying to buy milk and bread for their children. Hmm. And, and Sally, I guess in, in the sense of a vacuum of leadership in the country, uh, parliament can potentially step into that breach because there's certain things that MPs can ask for and get uh, if parliament is in session. That, uh, that, that journalists and ordinary folks can't. Absolutely, and also during a crisis, nothing is a zero-sum game. You know, what you need is to showcase all forms of leadership to be coming to the party. And often people downplay the role that proper use of parliament can achieve. And as the DA, this is something that we, we properly understand and have used for better you know, outcomes, including making sure that there's accountability in some of the deployment of the police forces, knowing that what is said to be allocated, it actually is what is being deployed to the ground, making sure that there is compliance, even with the implementation of the lockdown regulations, for instance, and some of the big wars that the DA has been able to win, which makes life better for all South Africans, mm -hmm. is because we have properly fulfilled our role in parliament and used the machinery of parliament to pressurize, to persuade, and most importantly, to make sure that the government acts within the prescripts of what is allowed to act for, 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 for itself. So trying to get parliament to reopen and get parliamentarians to do their job is not in any way outsourcing leadership. It is to make sure that our constitutional democracy functions because if there is no accountability, there would be far worse consequences because we know that this government is opportunistic in leveraging power and giving itself power that it doesn't have during moments like this because it knows that there isn't proper accountability. And, and let's get those ministers on record whether they'll be willing to give their 8,000 VIP protection, protectors to, to, to serve the public good. 
Never mind that, Celia's. It's got to the point now where ANC ministers need to come clear. I mean, we need to know where they stand. Uh, you know, Becky Tlele makes this statement which said absolutely nothing on TV the other day. Let's get him into Parliament. Let's get him standing in front of Parliament and let's ask him, why are police using water cannons on restaurateurs who are peacefully protesting outside Parliament, but there is, I have yet to see a water cannon being used in KZN. I saw them mm. being used in Kauteng. Why aren't they and, being and, used and in KZN? And folks queuing for, for social grants with the when, minister exactly, sitting yeah. inside. The minister the, sitting inside uh, Inyala directing where the water cannon must be. So let's get Minister Zulu to come and explain what, what, what was her line of thinking, because I want to know what these ministers' line of thinking are. Yeah. Where is the leader of government business? Because the last I heard, during a crisis, a pandemic, plus then we go into a crisis, a violent crisis in our country. According to what I know, the leader of government business is still in Russia receiving medical attention. It can't be. Hmm. What country in the world would, in a pandemic and a violent outbreak such as this, allow their government to be scattered around the country and not come together in the seat of government for, for parliament to take control? We have ministers whose children are tweeting the most outlandish yeah. things on Twitter and on social media, instigating violence to the point that Glynis Breitenbach utilised an existing piece of law that we just managed to pass, the cyber security law. She has gone to lay charges against the Zuma twins and against EFF members who are instigating violence. So what the public need to know is, yes, there are a couple of clowns, about 36 of them to be exact, 36, 37 clowns in Parliament. But there are also 89 incredibly dedicated MPs who are there to look after their best interests, to make sure that the law is upheld and to make sure that when we design law, because our job is legislatures, we don't design law for just now. We've just heard from Helen. It's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. We design law for governments that will come, for situations that will come. This Disaster Management Act is a disaster in and of itself because I've said it over and over again. It's created a prime minister versus a president scenario. So in this situation, who holds the real power? Hmm. Tasha, I want to get back to what you've just said and, and conclude with that about uh, Glynis Breitenbach, the DA's shadow justice minister, who have, has lodged these uh, charges of criminal incitement. Give us the details about that and... and do we hope that just, justice will be uh, done in this instance? Absolutely. I mean, um, this, the new Cyber Crimes Act is very, very harsh on, uh, on, on social media, uh, misinformation, fake news, and certainly the incitement to violence, bullying. Um, it's in reaction to what's happened across the world. We've seen uprisings happening across the world, and it's all done through social media. Now, the thing is, we know uh, data might cost a fortune in South Africa, but you can buy data packages for Twitter and for Insta and things like that. And what we have seen this violence, a lot of it has been coordinated on Twitter. It's been encouraged on Twitter and Insta. Um, and Glynis has gone this morning to lay these charges according to uh, the section uh, sections of the, the Cyber, Cyber Security Act, which prohibit you from instigating violence through the use of social media. And in fact, yesterday we saw Twitter suspend uh, uh, um, Julius Malema, which is a good thing to do because we don't need people inciting violence at a time where we should be calling for calm. And I mean, th this kind of vigilantism, it, it's not, isn't it interesting that those that call for the violence are hiding? Mm -hmm. And I saw a tweet from someone saying, Julius, this time, we're not coming onto the road with you. Why don't you go onto the road with you and your family? Hmm. Because they incite the violence, but they themselves will not go onto the streets and be part of that violence. So Glynis this morning laid these charges, um, and I have full uh, trust that the MPA is going to use this as the test case for the, for the new laws to make sure that they work and to make sure that people understand that you cannot use social media to instigate violence. Hmm. And that's a very important battle uh, to make sure that there are consequences uh, for people's actions because without consequences and if, if uh, famous people, people who are connected and, and have the Zuma family name, if they aren't held to account for their behavior, uh, then the rule of law doesn't stand a chance. We'll be back right after this.
a wrap, Mzansi. There is only one way to ultimately put an end to the lawlessness and grand-scale corruption afflicting South Africa. You have one incredibly powerful weapon to change all of this. Your vote. Please make sure you are correctly registered to vote by visiting check.da.org.za and encourage friends, family and colleagues to do the same. Just like communities have been standing together to protect their families from criminal looters, all South Africans who want a fair, safe and just future need to stand together now and vote out corrupt leaders and vote for change. And finally, over the past week, the DA has had to bid farewell to a number of party stalwarts. It is with great sadness that we've had to say goodbye to Cameron McKenzie, Clive Napier, Lebo More, and Peter Molapo. Their record of selfless and dedicated public service was a demonstration of their commitment to build a better South Africa. You will be deeply missed, and our thoughts and prayers are with your loved ones during these difficult times. Until next time, stay strong, South Africa.